Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 34. My name is Andy. Today we're going to talk about async and we're going to get into like what, what is async programming and how does it look in Rust? Um, and then the next few videos we're going to talk, dig into the details of that. So, uh, last time we talked about trait objects and uh, dynamic dispatch and good and bad ways of writing code in Rust. Do leave comments. Uh, to ask any questions or join my matrix room or something. Uh, yeah, so in this video, in the next few videos, we're going to talk about, um, well, like, it's what async programming in Rust looks like. Then we're going to move on to talk about the future, uh, trait, and then how the async and await keywords actually work, which are the kind of core of how you write Rust, uh, async Rust day to day. Then we'll look at, like, how to use Tokyo to actually run your async stuff. Um, and then a quick look at the, Axon web framework, which is one web framework which is based on async stuff. But this video is going to be like, what is async and how does, what's the kind of way of thinking about it? What we're going to learn is basically the mechanics of what like async and await mean and how they, how they work in Rust, a bit different from some other languages and also a bit similar. Um, uh, understand some of the reasons why things are like that and the trade offs, um, of choosing to do async programming. Um, how it all works, what futures do, and how to actually write some async Rust. So let's kick off with the first bit, which is um, a recap of what the difference between concurrency and parallelism is. So um, async is mostly about concurrency. It can be parallel, but it's about... Um, uh, having multiple things, multiple balls up in the air being juggled at the same time, not necessarily actually processing uh, calculations simultaneously, but like you kicked off some some process like, uh, um, I shouldn't say process, yeah, you kicked off something like uh, loading from a file, which takes ages, and then you've got, you've got your CPU left over ready to do other stuff while that's all happening, so um, you can do other tasks at the same time. So interleaves work, whereas parallelism, we're generally talking about you're doing some number crunching. You need a whole CPU for that. So if you want to do two of those at a time, you need two CPUs for that, or two cores. Um, yeah, so async is often about um, I kicked off something and I'm waiting to be told it's happened, like a web request has come in or a file has finished being opened or read or whatever. Um, yeah, so this stuff, that, this video is about concurrency specifically, even though some concurrent runtimes, some async runtimes, they will run your stuff in parallel, but the way, the kind of paradigm within which we're operating is a concurrent paradigm. So what is async programming? Um, it is concurrent, as I said. Um, it's good for things that have a lot of IO to do, a lot of web requests, files to open or save or something like that. So web servers are like a perfect use case for async programming. And then with the async and await syntax, you can write code which behaves concurrently, but which looks like you're just writing standard code that um, steps forward line by line. And when you're waiting for something, it, it's kind of um, not hidden from you in the code, but it, uh, the, the pain of like coming, get, getting yourself back into the state you were in before you started waiting because something's now happened is handled for you by the language. All right, so... Um, Another slightly different uh, comparison between uh, async and something else. This is this is about like um, kicking off async um, tasks versus launching operating system threads. So an operating system thread would be a way of doing um, potentially parallel work um, in a separate um, uh, stream of execution. Um, and uh, Rust's async does not use operating system threads. I mean they they're involved underneath. But when you do something asynchronously, you're not saying, please kick me off a new thread. One, there may be threads underneath that are actually executing your code. Um, but uh, you won't create a thread when you do something async. So switching and spawning a task in async is cheap, whereas creating an operating system thread is relatively expensive. Um, uh, other differences in an operating system thread, it's fine for you to just sit there waiting for something with the whole thread blocked. Um, and the operating system will get on with some other thread stuff. Uh, but that's not okay in your async code. Your async code assumes, the way the async runtime works, it assumes you're always going to be making progress. And if you have to stop and wait for anything, you will explicitly tell it, um, I'm stopping and waiting. It's sometimes called cooperative multitasking. 
um, because you're cooperating with the, the runtime by saying, um, I, I've got nothing I can do right now, so I'm going to give back control to you explicitly. And in Rust, that would be normally be done by uh, using the await keyword. Um, and then where would you use these things? Well, yeah, if you're crunching numbers, you should be probably spawning an operating system thread and just getting on with crunching those numbers. Um, and some other stuff can happen in other threads. Um, and asynchronous is really well suited for uh, input-output type stuff like web servers or something that's reading a load of files or something like that. Um, and then one of the critical um, sort of downsides of asynchronous programming is this last line about reusing synchronous code. Um, if you're writing stuff that just executes in, some, in its own thread, you can just call functions that you've already got that do certain types of job. Um, in asynchronous code, you kind of, all your stuff needs to be asynchronous all the way down. Because of this thing that you can't block, you can't um, call into code that's going to take a long time to execute and, and lock up your runtime, um, especially if it's doing stuff like opening files and things, but it's doing it in a synchronous way where it's blocking and sitting there waiting for that file to open. You can't reuse that code in your async code. You need special async file opening code or listening for a web request code or whatever. So sometimes this can feel like a real burden because you've got existing code that you want to use and you can't use it in the async world. Or it can feel like nothing at all because you might be living inside a completely async world. If you're using something like the Axum or Actix uh, web frameworks, um, you've got all the bits and bobs you need to do stuff asynchronously available to you. So this doesn't feel like much of a burden. Okay, so what does async code look like in Rust? And we'll get more into... Uh, what this means later, but um, this is just um, like a first look. So what it looks like is you have a function which is async, and the reason we know it's async is because it has the word async before it, and then it does some stuff. Um, in this case, it calls some other async function, and in order to call an async function and wait for its result, um, we have to use the dot await um, construction after so we, we call it as if it's like a normal function and then we say dot await afterwards because um, this this thing actually returns a future which we'll get into what that means in a second and then await means um, uh, tell the runtime that I'm waiting for something give up control and then later the runtime will kind of wake us up again uh, back in the same place with all the same context um, with the answer that came back from that future so um, even though this function run says it returns a result, anyhow result in this case, um, if you just call run, what it returns is a future of a result. Uh, and then in this case, the, the way we're kicking all this off in the first place, because this, like I said, all these functions, all these async functions, they can't be mixed up with synchronous functions um, or synchronous functions that block at least. They all re actually return futures, even though it's not written here in their type. Um, so this run returns a future, and then in order to make it um, actually get executed and finish, we have to call this block on method on uh, the Tokyo runtime. Tokyo is one of the runtimes, the only one that we're going to talk about, really. So in order to run async code, you have to make a Tokyo runtime called block on, uh, uh, and then give it a future, that, and we're giving it the future that came back from calling run. And what block on does will actually block this thread and wait until that um, the async, all the async kind of stuff has finished executing and given you back an, an actual result instead of a future um, and then gives it back to you. Uh, yeah, so uh, functions that are async, i.e. ones that kind of automatically return a future. Well, we're going to talk about what futures mean, by the way, so we'll, we'll get into this. Um, you say async before them, and then when you call them, if you want to not have a future but have the actual answer back, you call, you say await, you can't say await unless you're in an async function. So we couldn't have said await in this code because main is not an async function. Um, so that's why there's this coloring thing of like some functions are colored async and some of them are just normal functions. Um, you need you, Your function needs to be async if you're going to call await inside. So you could have called load config inside a non-async function, but it would return you back a future, which you would then have to find a way of waiting for somehow. Um, whereas if you're in an async function, you can just make use of the compiler doing the hard work for you of saying, um, pause me, go off and do some other stuff, and then when this feature is ready, 
wake me up again and carry me on. You can see that scrape is also an async function, and again, we need to await it. By the way, the question mark here is just completely normal question mark. So once, obviously, load config returns the future of a result, um, and then we get rid of the future by awaiting it, so now we've got a result, and then we can just call question mark um, to, in the normal way to, to return a result, like return an error if there's a problem, or just continue with a, an OK value if not. So that's the general look of what an async function looks like. And we're not going to get into exactly how you write this stuff any more than that yet, because first we're going to look at like what's going on underneath. So, as I've been saying, um, asynchronous code in Rust revolves around this thing called a future. Future is a trait. A future is a little bit like a promise in JavaScript, if you've used one of them, or a task in C-sharp, um, or I think it's got a future in Python. Um, well, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, async functions return things which are implement future. And then a key thing about Rust that's different from other languages, if you've done any of this stuff in other languages, is that futures are inert. Now, I need to explain what that means. What that means is um, a future object doesn't represent the fact that some work is going on in the background, uh, that which is different from something like a JavaScript promise. In JavaScript, if you get back a promise, or in Python, if you get back what I think is called a future, um, you you know that actually underneath some other work is going on. Some kind of threadish like thing has been spawned and is executing. And the the promise is just giving you a way of getting back the answer um, when it appears. It's like a kind of holder for when this when this thing that's executing in the background finishes, put the answer here. But that's not what it's like in Rust. In Rust, if you want to get back the answer, someone has to call some methods on that future. Now, normally in our code, we don't do that explicitly. That's what the runtime is for. I've been saying this thing about this thing called Tokyo, which is a runtime, and there are other runtimes. The job of that runtime is to do this thing of making sure that if you want the answer from the future, you call a method on the future called poll. Um, and we'll see how that works. In fact, what we're going to do before we get into how to actually write async code is find out how this future stuff actually works underneath, at least to some extent. It's, it's complicated. So we won't go all the way in. Um, okay, so futures are inert, as in someone has to be calling poll on those futures, but it's not normally you. Um, other things about async, um, it's zero cost. Uh, that means you don't, um, is it really zero cost? I mean, you need a runtime. So there is some kind of cost to constructing a runtime and stuff like that. But um, I guess what this is saying is the actual keyword here, putting that on your function, it just transforms your function into a different form. It doesn't add any overhead. Um, and then, yeah, there is no built-in runtime, but in order to do async programming, you need a runtime. Um, but they, it's just that there are a few different choices, and the choice that you'll normally make is going to be Tokyo, but there are other good choices. Um, and one of the reasons there are different choices is that some runtimes are multi-threaded and some are single-threaded, and they have slightly different uh, constraints on your code in that situation. Also, for example, if you're in some kind of embedded environment where there is no threading, then you can't use a multi-threaded runtime. So at least by default, I think always, Tokyo is multi-threaded. So Tokyo will spawn a bunch of threads in the background to match the number of um, cores you've got on your machine. And then all of your async code will just automatically execute on whichever thread is available. And you don't have to think about it at all. So it's super cool for making a web server or something like that. Um, async can be mixed with other types of concurrency, which we won't really talk about. Um, and async code in Rust is relatively new. It's getting more mature all the time, and there are more debugging tools. Um, but it can still be hard to figure out what's going wrong if your async code is not working the way you thought it was. Um, so what can you expect when you're doing async code in Rust? Well, you can expect things to run incredibly fast. Many of the benchmarks for like the fastest web servers um, ever, which is a stupid benchmark probably, but anyway, um, they're, they're being run, being won by async Rust programs, or if not one, very close to the top. You can get really, really good performance out of a single CPU or, a, you know, a few CPUs, um, by writing async code because it's really efficient. It, it, it lets you kick off your IO and then do some more work in the meantime. Um, but you're going to end up hitting some more difficult concepts. Async code in all languages is much harder to understand than synchronous code. Uh, that's true in Rust too. 
And in typical Rust style, instead of kind of trying to wave away the complexity, Rust will expose it in a way that is controllable by you, but you, you need to understand it. Um, so you are going to hit a bit of complexity, like understanding what a pin is, or at least typing the word pin and not understanding what it is. Um, and this introduction that I'm about to give you to how futures work under the hood, it's good to have that in your mind to help you understand how async works, even though you're not doing this stuff in, um, in practice that often. Okay, uh, also you're going to have what, what they're referring to here as compatibility issues. Basically, your async code is going to be kind of separate from your synchronous code. Uh, and also, yeah, at the moment, the ecosystem is still stabilizing, I'd say. It's getting there. Like, people people seem to have worked out that Tokyo is a good runtime, and for a lot of uses, we'll just use Tokyo. And that that choice used to be a bit more complicated, and uh, I'm glad that that's kind of settled down a bit, as, even though, as I say, there are other good choices for si different situations. Uh, the other wrinkle that you're going to hit, which I think will soon hopefully be fixed, but is not fixed in this June of 2024, is that um, you can't have... Um, async functions in traits. So you can't declare a trait that says a one of the methods on that trait is async uh, in stable Rust. There is a um, crate called async trait. Uh, what's it called? Async traits, I think. Async trait, um, which lets you effectively lets you do this. Um, um, by adding some extra sugar that is a little bit less efficient. So there's a little bit of um, runtime, a very small runtime cost to pay for using async traits at the moment. That is coming, uh, I think, fairly soon. You will be able to just say async fun in a trait and it'll all work, um, but that's tricky. So anyway, that's the, the point of that is um, you're going to hit some wrinkles using async rust, which are gradually going to be ironed out over the next few years, and that this bit will get less relevant, but you're still going to run into more advanced features of the language than if you're doing non-async stuff. Okay, so I mentioned that um, async support is not um, fully mature. So what is the state of support? Well, um, all the stuff you need, all features and stuff like that are in the standard library and, and share between any different implementations. Async in a way are completely native to the language, fully supported, um, apart from that caveat about async functions in traits. Um, there's a futures crate, which is very widely used, um, which contains like extra utilities around futures and things like that, which is all pretty standardized. Um, but the actual runtimes like Tokyo, um, are not part of the standard library, not kind of, there's not like one blessed one, although I think Tokyo is, um, very widely used. Other examples are async stood, which uh, used to be a rival to Tokyo, but is less widely used in, in my experience, uh, recently. And small, which I think is one for like embedded, uh, uses, uh, and there are others for more specialized uses. Um, so you, you should not worry about that and use Tokyo and then learn about it when you, when you need to know.